Okay, so, so I'm going to uh, start off with some of the uh, highlights of the French Revolution, the reasons for it, and then I'll go on to Napoleon Bonaparte, how he rose to the emperorship of uh, the empire and ultimately the collapse, hence the rise and fall um, of the Napoleonic Empire. And I want to uh, close up with a little concentration on two events, I think, which really characterize the, uh, the, the end, uh, beginning of the end and uh, the final end of the Napoleonic Empire. And that would be the battles of Waterloo and uh, battle of Trafalgar. So with that, let's ahead with the French Revolution. So there's what uh, Europe looked like on the eve of the uh, revolution 1789. Uh, essentially the major great powers here, of course uh, the Great Britain, Kingdom of Denmark and Norway, that was actually a, a, a united crown there. Of course, Sweden, very prominent, the Austrian Empire. And you'll notice that Italy is divided into a number of states. Uh, Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, there are a number of papal states. They're actually um, owned by the papacy. Uh, so not only was the Pope the, a spiritual leader of the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but he also was a temporal ruler, uh, monarch in, in central Italy there. Uh, France, uh, Spain, and Portugal, pretty much as they are today. The Ottoman Empire was particularly large at the time. In fact, uh, as late as the 1690s, they were besieging Vienna. Uh, so they're going to be a major player up until about this time. And what you see in the early 19th century is they uh, retract, retract, retract. And you get the Greek freedom and uh, the establishment of Serbia, what have you. But this is what it looked like uh, essentially on the eve of the uh, uh, French Revolution. Now, Germany here, uh, the most dominant state is going to be Prussia. Uh, there's Berlin right about in there. And um, what you got to remember about Germany is it was not united until uh, finally until 1871. So uh, it's going to be a whole uh, assortment of principalities, duchies, small kingdoms, free cities. Uh, and that's the state of Central Europe there, Germany. Well, there's the unfortunate Bourbon monarchy, uh, monarch, uh, King Louis the 16th. Uh, he was one of the weakest of all the, the French monarchs. He, he wasn't a bad fellow, but uh, he was described as, as immature, lacking self-confidence, austere in manner, not ostentatious, uh, but very quiet and reserved. And he also was a type of leader who he would make a decision based basically on what the last person he talked to had advocated. So he's not going to be a very strong leader. Uh, he was very much interested in the conduct of foreign policy. Uh, but he really lacked the, the strength of character or the, or the strength of character to make a decision, really. Um, and so what happened during this period is royal finances uh, just simply ran amok. And there were a succession of royal finance ministers that attempted to reform the royal finances, but really it was a, an uphill battle. And you'll see why momentarily. One of the big reasons for the uh, French um, royal revenue in such bad shape was they had put a lot of money into supporting the uh, American Patriot rebels in the, the War of American Independence. And so all throughout the 1780s, by the time it got to 1789, royal finances were in such a mess that the king was forced to call uh, the National Assembly, which was known as the Estates General. And uh, it had not met since 1614 almost two centuries. So that kind of illustrates just how bad the uh, royal finances were. The reason for calling the Estates General, pretty simple. Uh, if you're going to raise taxes, this was a way to do it. If the uh, assembly, the estates, uh, voted for tax increases, uh, uh, then, uh, uh, then they would go through and that would hopefully uh, bail out the, the royal revenue. But by six, 1789, the French public was not in any mood for raising royal revenue. And so that is going to kick off a whole series of events that collectively we call the French Revolution. Well, there is Queen Marie Antoinette. Uh, she probably did not say, uh, let them eat cake. Um, I, I suspect that was a bit of a propaganda piece uh, by the uh, opponents of the monarchy. Nonetheless, uh, she was a perfect target because she was uh, associated with that decline in the moral and political authority of the French uh, monarchy, 
um, this was the high court of France, uh, very much into fashion and uh, I would say ostentatious, uh, over, overreaching. Uh, that's a good term. I ought to patent it or copyright it. Ostentatious overreaching. Uh, and so if you have people who can't get uh, bread to feed their children, uh, and then here you have the court looking like, well, you can see the gown there she's wearing, looking like that. Uh, you can only imagine how that's going to bubble up and create a lot of hate and discontent. I think the reason really that the, the fall of the monarchy occurred uh, was primarily because uh, Marie Antoinette primarily was pushing court policy or court resistance to the progress of the, of the French Revolution. I think that's what finally led to the overthrow of the monarchy by August of 1792. Well, here is the problem. Uh, in France, you had essentially what were known as estates, first, second, and third. Uh, first estate was the nobility, titled nobility. Second estate was the clergy. And the third estate was everybody else. And that would be all the way from the poorest peasant or homeless person, all the way up to um, uh, very wealthy business people, uh, attorneys, uh, doctors, professors, uh, what we would today call the, the, uh, the upper middle class. So everybody other than the clergy and the title nobility would be part of the third estate. Here's the rub. The first and second estate paid very little taxes. So if you're going to raise money by tax reform, uh, most of it is going to come from the third estate. And so uh, there you see uh, that political cartoon, which by the way, political cartoons, lampooning or making political statements goes way on back. Uh, centuries. It's not something that's just a modern phenomenon. But there you see uh, a cartoon that illustrates the first and second estates riding the back of the third estate. Well, one of the key events here that uh, really kicked off the uh, French Revolution was the storming of the Bastille. And the Bastille was this medieval fortress in central Paris that uh, had been converted into a, a prison. And the word went out, the rumor went out that they were holding political prisoners there, people who opposed the monarchy. Well, they weren't. Uh, there actually were only seven prisoners uh, there at the time. And this is going to be 14 July, 1789. And um, so a crowd gathered, uh, demanded that the political prisoners be released. Uh, when there were only seven or so, uh, then they uh, demanded that the governor of the prison release the arms and ammunition that was stored there. Uh, when he refused, the crowd stormed it, captured the place, and the storming of the Bastille came to be symbolic of the, uh, of the French Revolution. By the way, it was subsequently demolished by the revolutionary government, but that's why the French still celebrate as their Independence Day, uh, comparable to our July 4th, they celebrate Bastille Day every 14th uh, of July. All righty. Well, so the estates general uh, meets, and here's the problem. Uh, there are really two houses uh, or two, two assemblies. The first and second estates meet together and the third estate, call it the commons, like the British House of Commons, uh, they meet separately, but each has a vote. And so the first and second estate can always outvote the, the assembly of the third estate. And um, what happens is the, uh, the rumor goes out that the third estate assembly is being uh, shuttered uh, by the monarchy, meaning they show up at the usual place of meeting and it's locked up. And so they all devolved onto an indoor tennis court and took an oath. And there you see representatives signing it, a uh, picture very much like the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and the oath of the tennis court says that this uh, assembly will not uh, dissolve itself, will continue to meet wherever and whenever until there is a new constitution written. Well, finally, the king uh, relented uh, a few days later and ordered the clergy and the nobility, uh, the first and second estates, to join with the third estate and form what was called a national assembly. Uh, that, uh, within a, a few months, devolved into what was called the constituent assembly, meaning uh, to write a constitution. So now you have this national assembly and 
it was essentially the first of the revolutionary assemblies. What's interesting about this uh, uh, painting here, there you see members of the clergy. Over here, you're gonna have some members of the aristocracy. And here you're gonna have the members uh, representing the third estate. So it is in fact a national assembly. So uh, it gets replaced by the legislative assembly uh, later on in 1791 with the formal name of a national constituent assembly. So what you're seeing here is this evolution from we we're going to meet, we have the right to meet, and now we have the right to construct a brand new constitution. Uh, and by 1791, this assembly has passed a pretty radical agenda for a financial and political reform. So that's really what kicks off the, uh, the uh, French Revolution in terms of, of violence and, and political conflict. Well, there are the sans culottes. And if anybody speaks French out there, I apologize for butchering it. I, um, I uh, read French, translate French, <laughs> I don't speak it. But what sans culottes basically means is without knee breeches. Uh, culottes were essentially the, the knee breeches that were the fashion of the 18th century, then typically for the upper class would have been made of silk. Whereas the average common working man would have worn uh, what you see here, pantaloons, they were known as, essentially long trousers. Well, the sans culotte was essentially the, the radical mob. Uh, they started out essentially uh, as um, uh, being supporters of reform, particularly financial and political reform. But by about 1792, 93, it's become very radicalized. And in fact, it becomes the, uh, the violent uh, uh, mob uh, of, the, of the more radical folks, particularly uh, as you're gonna get down into the uh, period of the terror, uh, they become the hit squad, if, if you will. So that's the sans culottes. And uh, they would periodically uh, literally raise hell. Um, there was a, a pretty serious uprising there in Paris in May of 1793. Uh, and uh, they in fact were the strongest and most important uh, of all the citizen groups uh, in, uh, particularly in Paris. Street agitation, uh, violence, uh, powerful and often overwhelming street army. Uh, so think of, think of that type of dynamic there. They demanded things like uh, fixed prices, uh, jobs, uh, and they are going to uh, really transition from that uh, focus on justice and equality to really become uh, pawns in the hands of the more radical politicians. Uh, I think certainly by May of 1793, you in fact see that. Now, 1795, they're going to be pretty gone. Uh, I think even the most radical members of of the French assembly and the government realized that uh, these folks are, are dangerous and they're not helping the cause. And really by, by about 1795 or so, you began to see them uh, being uh, cramped, uh, put down, uh, disbanded, if you will, uh, by the army essentially. Well, back to poor old Louis the 16th and Marie and Quinette. September, 1792. The convention abolishes the monarchy. And so from that date on, 21 September, 1792, uh, that essentially becomes the French First Republic. Now the monarchy is still around. They're more or less in house arrest. They attempt to flee and they're captured. They're recognized and captured and brought back to Paris. And for several months, they're essentially uh, kept under house arrest. Uh, however, what develops uh, at this time is a struggle really between uh, two radical groups, the, the Jacobins from the Jacobin Club uh, of Paris, which was a, a radical social club that became very politically powerful. And so what you're seeing is this increased uh, one-upsmanship for who can be the most radical uh, in terms of reform. And by this time, late 1792, uh, the more radicals are winning out, and they demand uh, the trial of the, uh, uh, of the monarchy uh, for treason or, or other charges against the state. And of course, that results in the uh, execution, conviction and execution of uh, both the king and the queen. Now we're getting into the period known as the terror or the reign of terror. Uh, 
September 1793 for about nine months. Uh, it didn't really last that long till July of 1794. And essentially it became a civil war of many factions. You had the Royalists, uh, particularly in, in the more rural parts of the kingdom, uh, especially in the Vendée, which was that area uh, over on the Atlantic coast. But you had within the radicals, you had two groups and um, they're vying essentially for who's going to dominate. The, um, the government is run by a committee of public safety, committee of public safety. And that's essentially formed to, to act as an executive, but there isn't really that much uh, uh, executive authority. Uh, a lot of power is, is literally in the hands of the mob. Think the same culottes. And uh, as might be expected, uh, a strong man arises and that is going to be a lawyer, very prominent lawyer by the name of Maximilien Robespierre. And he essentially becomes not really a dictator, but he becomes the, the primary shaker and mover of the Jacobin uh, side. He actually is accused of being too moderate by the far left, and he's seen as too radical by the far right. So, so now you've more or less removed the monarchy. Uh, a lot of the supporters are fleeing. Some of you may uh, have read the book, uh, uh, The Scarlet Pimpernel, those stories, or, or seen the, uh, it was a really, really exceptionally good miniseries a few years back. Uh, the the storyline is this, this Englishman is uh, attempting to rescue people who are being chased down or uh, sought for execution by, uh, by the terror. Uh, well, the terror is essentially a dramatic and pretty radical reaction against anybody seen as opposing the revolution. And it's not just royalists or people who are uh, seen to support the royalists. Uh, it is the more radical Jacobins uh, executing the less radical uh, members of the legislature or the government. So it's, it's pretty much chaos all around. Well, as you kind of might imagine, this type of scenario can't really uh, last very long. And so eventually Robespierre is forced out. He's actually um, convicted of treason and uh, executed. This is known as the Thermidorian reaction. It's gonna to topple Robespierre. It's going to pretty well topple the, these uh, uh, radicals that are, that are uh, going after anybody they see as opposing the revolution. Uh, so now we're up to the summer of uh, 1794. And Robespierre, as I said, is convicted of treason and uh, eventually becomes the victim of the, of the very terror that uh, kept him in office. During this reign of terror, uh, approximately 300,000 people were arrested, 17,000 officially executed, and perhaps 10,000 or so died without trial in prison. And one of the ways if you were convicted, uh, because the juries at this time, you really you're innocent or you're guilty. And if you're guilty, you go to the guillotine. Uh, it was that simple. Uh, the guillotine actually was invented to be more humanitarian uh, by a French doctor uh, as a way of executing people. Um, I think it's pretty grim and ghastly, but nonetheless, if compared to say hanging or the headsman's ax, it probably was a better way to go. Uh, but you can imagine how notorious it became simply because of just the vast numbers of people who might be accused of treason and summarily executed. Uh, that was what the, the terror was pretty much all about. Well, that Thermidorian reaction, of course, uh, ended the terror. People had enough of that. And that brought in what was known as the directory. And the directory actually lasted for about uh, four, four to five years. One of the things that saved the directory was Napoleon. Here you see, uh, one of the early instances of Napoleon coming to prominence. And this is uh, October 1795. What happened here was there was a, a royalist mob, about 20,000 people it's estimated uh, that were uh, advocating for the return of the monarchy. They had collected about 40 artillery pieces in Paris to use it against the directory, against the, the revolutionary government. Well, Napoleon organized a, a scheme and actually recovered this artillery and turned it on the mob. And you can only imagine uh, firing grape shot 
uh, at a mob, how quickly that's going to disperse them. If you're not familiar with grape shot, it's essentially a, a lot of large iron balls packed into a, a round and then fired. It's almost like a shotgun effect. Uh, so you can imagine uh, when around 15 or 20 of these iron balls are blown out of the muzzle of a cannon at short range, uh, you can only imagine how uh, serious that would be if you were standing a few yards in front of it. So a whiff of grape shot, it came to be called. That really was the last gasp of royalism trying to uh, overturn the, the French government. And the directory, the, the new government was so grateful that they uh, appointed uh, Brigadier General Bonaparte who actually was in Paris just without a command. He didn't have a command at the time. So they gave him a command. Uh, commander of the Army of Italy. And at that point, 1796, uh, he marched off to Italy and summarily thumped the Austrians. So what you're seeing is Italy, very early on in the, the whole French Revolution, becoming a part of a, a growing French empire. Well, the directory had very little executive authority, and this was by design. They did not want another rise of Robespierre, some dominant individual, and so there were five directors that were rotated through. Uh, a couple of them would be uh, annually elected. Uh, but the problem was uh, they had very little power, executive power, and uh, corruption was pretty bad. And so uh, Napoleon, who had gone off to Egypt, it was the famous Egyptian campaign of 1798, returned, and that's when you have the file of grenadiers. Now, by this time, 1799, the uh, legislature was uh, essentially divided as a bicameral legislature, very much like, say, our House of uh, our Senate, House of Representatives, or, or the British Parliament, which has the two houses, um, the House of Lords and the uh, House of Commons. Well, the, um, uh, the directors would be proposed by the uh, Council of 500, that basically was the elected assembly. And then it would be approved by the Council of Ancients. Council of Ancients. These were all over 40 years old. Um, I actually would, at this point in my life, would not consider that ancient. Uh, nonetheless, um, it just simply meant that these were older, more mature people. Uh, and uh, the theory was that they would be more uh, considerating, considerate of uh, legislation and, and tamp down some of the more radical proposals that might come up from the, uh, from the uh, legislature. Well, Napoleon returned. There was a lot of hate and discontent against the directory by this time, I think largely driven by the, the corruption. And you have the famous file of grenadiers. Now a file is a, a small military formation about squad size. So you're only talking about nine, 10, 11 guys. But here, if you look very carefully, there you see the grenadiers right there wearing that the grenadier bonnet, which is uh, by this time usually made of uh, bear skin. So Napoleon, General Napoleon, walked into the uh, meeting house here, the Council of Ancients, and they had become so overwhelmed with uh, their own self-importance that they had taken to wearing orange togas, the throwback to the Roman Empire, the Roman Senate. Well, when Napoleon showed up with these eight or nine soldiers, grenadiers, uh, he basically disbanded the, uh, the government. And there's a description of, of these uh, gentlemen, many of them somewhat elderly, dressed in these orange togas, leaping out of the windows of the, uh, of the meeting house. Um, kind of a comic scene, but the end result of this is Napoleon is now essentially the head of state. What they do is they create uh, the consulate. And this is the next step in that evolution of the French, uh, French government. And the idea here is there are three consuls, but most power is vested in the first consul. And that of course is Napoleon Bonaparte uh, in February of 1800. So a couple months after the, the uh, file of Grenadiers incident, uh, there's a public referendum that voted for the appointment of Napoleon as first consul and for this new government, 99.9% .9 voter approval. Wouldn't any politician love to have that result? Well, so Bonaparte, what was he? He 
was from a minor Corsican noble family. Uh, Corsica had been taken over by France in 1769. So ethnically, uh, Napoleon was Italian, uh, but of course now he's French. He was educated at uh, uh, French military college. He was commissioned into the French artillery. And by December of 1793, he's a captain of artillery posted at Toulon. At Toulon, this is when the British are finally into the war. And there's an attempt by the British Royal Navy and uh, uh, French Royalists to try to retake uh, Toulon. Well, Napoleon, Captain Bonaparte here, uh, he organizes the defense that's successful at Toulon. And in gratitude, uh, the assembly promotes him to Brigadier General. And that really kicks off his, uh, his military career. Um, now, Napoleon, uh, he does uh, go on campaign frequently. Uh, there's a famous picture by the artist David, who did a lot of the paintings of Napoleon, um, many of, of which you have probably seen. Um, so Napoleon uh, marched back into Italy in 1800, the famous Battle of Marengo, where once again, he thrashed the Austrians. And by this time, essentially, uh, the French Empire pretty much dominates uh, most of, of Italy. Well, how do we get to the empire? Uh, after Marengo, uh, there's another plebiscite referendum and uh, about 98, 99% of the French voters um, elect Napoleon as the first consul for life. Well, the problem is uh, now you no longer have a, a hereditary succession. And there's concern that what happens if, if Napoleon dies, if he dies on campaign or is assassinated or just dies of natural causes. And so uh, at this point, uh, they go back to essentially a monarchy. They reestablish the monarchy. Uh, and so the House of Bonaparte becomes the rulers of France, the hereditary rulers. You're back to a monarchy. But France very clearly has built an empire uh, dominating Italy and other parts of Europe. And so he becomes the emperor, Emperor Napoleon I. This is 1804. Uh, sort of a comical scene. Uh, the French Revolution did not get along very well with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but one of the things Napoleon does is uh, the concordat, uh, which is the agreement or from the root word concord. And uh, so the idea here is to make peace with the uh, church one of the big changes is the priests are no longer beholden completely to the papacy in Rome because they are now paid civil servants of the state. So there's some give and take from both sides. But in order to legitimize himself, uh, Napoleon invites the Pope to come to uh, Paris. And in fact, in Cathedral of Notre Dame, they have the investiture. And uh, what's interesting is Napoleon, just as the Pope is about to place the imperial crown on his head, Napoleon grabs it and places it on his own head. Uh, nonetheless, the, the, the Pope uh, has to just smile and carry on smartly. Well, from this point on, uh, Napoleon, for the next several years, pretty much runs, uh, runs rapid all over Europe. He defeats the Austrians, captures Vienna, uh, defeats uh, at Austerlitz, famous battle there, the Russians and the Austrians at Jena, uh, Jena Auerstadt, 1806, he crushes the, the Prussians. And then in 1807, he thumps the Russians again. So every time one of these anti-Napoleon coalitions springs up, um, Napoleon marches off and soundly defeats them. Except for Great Britain. Britain is the only one he can nev never defeat. And that's primarily because Britain is a naval power. So in 1803, 1804, in that period, uh, Napoleon attempts to mount an invasion of Great Britain. He gathers the Grand Armée uh, on the northern coast of France. And the idea is to draw away the Royal Navy uh, away from the channel long enough to allow the French army to come across the channel. That's going to be ultimately defeated at uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, which I'll explain shortly. But, but in reality, Napoleon realized that that just wasn't going to happen. And even before the Battle of Trafalgar happened, uh, he had redirected the Grand Armée 
towards the east, and that's going to result in all these great battles I just mentioned uh, between 1805 and 1809, uh, Ulm, Austerlitz, Jena, etc. Now, Napoleon wasn't all about military. Uh, he did um, do a great number of things to rationalize and modernize uh, French administration and governance, and particularly the law codes. Um, there is a copy of the Code Napoleon, uh, which by the way, if this were a live meeting, I would ask, okay, which state in the United States still uses the Code Napoleon as its uh, basic law code? And the answer would be Louisiana. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be able to all get back together in, a, in one room and, and I can ask these, these uh, trivia questions. Well, the Code Napoleon uh, was interesting uh, in that it reflected very much what was known as Justinian's Code from the old uh, Byzantine Roman Empire. Uh, and so there are still a lot of countries in Europe that uh, still use the Code Napoleon. But essentially it, it uh, codified and did away with a lot of the old uh, uh, feudal law codes and traditions that, that were just um, essentially still in operation, uh, but by this time needed to be uh, codified into a national code. And that's what the Code Napoleon did. So uh, he wasn't just a, a military man, um, but uh, very much involved in civil administration and, uh, uh, and law reform. And by the way, France was very prosperous in this time. People were very happy with Napoleon and his government. Uh, France seemed to be on top of the world, uh, expanding the empire. Uh, people were happy, people were, were prosperous. Uh, a total reversal of what had happened uh, in the previous two decades. But war is going to dominate the period. And once the British get involved in the war in 1793, uh, essentially uh, it becomes for the British yet another one of these global conflicts between uh, Britain and its empire and the French and, uh, and ultimately the, uh, the Spanish a period of 23 years of almost constant continuous warfare. There was a brief break about uh, 1802, 03, the Peace of Amiens. But other than that, it was one coalition against Napoleon after another. There is some debate as to how many there actually were, but there were at least six alliances or coalitions that formed um, against France. And the typical players were the, the, the Prussians, the Austrians, the Russians, and the British uh, aligned against uh, Napoleon. Now I want to turn, since the British are involved in the maritime, and talk a little bit about uh, the Royal Navy in the period. Jack Tar, the traditional nickname of the British sailor, uh, won in every port. Well, talk about that in a moment. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why uh, the British sailor is known as Jack Tar. And one of them was because when you're on formal parade, dress uniform on formal parade, uh, the long hair would be cued, meaning pulled back and sometimes braided, uh, but they would use uh, pine pitch, which was tar, what it was called, uh, and think of that as the early brill cream. Um, so the problem there is you can see what that's going to do to the, the back of the, the uniform jacket there, pea coat. And so they developed a uniform uh, with a flap uh, that could be taken out and laundered, attached and taken out and laundered. Um, but that's, that's where the term Jack Tar came from, the, the tar pitch, pine pitch that would be put in the hair to slick it down, if you will. A, um, another theory, uh, which I think is also valid, is uh, all of the, the rigging of the ship, of course, were, were rope, typically hemp rope. And, out at sea with the salt air uh, that very quickly deteriorated. So there you would coat not only your mast and spars of, uh, with this pine pitch to protect it from the salt water, but you would also um, uh, put the pitch all over your, your rigging, your rope rigging. Well, in order to get into the mast, of course, you had to climb up the rope um, ratlins, they were called. And you can imagine what the hands looked like. So uh, all this pine pitch all over the sailors. So a couple of reasons why they might be called uh, Jack Tar. 
Well, one in every port. No, not really. Uh, there was a real concern about desertion. And so typically, unless they were in home port or where the crew was being paid off and then sent ashore and basically uh, retired, uh, very little opportunity for the average sailor to get ashore. And so what the, they typically would do uh, is uh, invite uh, certain business ladies from ashore to come aboard the warship and set up shop. I don't think I need to go any further with that. Um, but that typically was, uh, was how port visits were handled. Very much concerned about uh, desertion, uh, and particularly in wartime. And, and so that uh, Liberty Call, Liberty Call, now all hands Liberty Call was very rare, uh, even among the professional sailors. Well, what about the elemental British tar? What was the typical sailor like? Most were very long service, if not in the Royal Navy, in the uh, Merchant Navy, and they tended to go between the two uh, because we, you didn't at the time say join the Royal Navy and re-enlist and have a long career. Uh, you might do that, but each time your ship was brought in and not really decommissioned, but decrewed, uh, perhaps going into dockyard for a refit or decommission or whatever, the crew would be paid off and told off. And at that point, uh, if they wanted to re-up uh, for the Royal Navy on another ship, great, or they could go uh, sign on to a merchant vessel. So very often these sailors who were extremely skilled, exceptionally skilled, they were constantly at sea, either sailing with the Royal Navy or sailing in the civilian. Uh, there's a lot of mythology, particularly about the press gang. Uh, ship's captains uh, in time of war, uh, of course, you would have the usual attrition by disease, by illness, by desertion, by combat casualties. If a ship got to the point where they could not effectively operate due to lack of crew, then they were authorized to send the press gang ashore and essentially say, hey, mate, you're now in His Majesty's Navy. Uh, a lot of mythology here. Uh, the usual person pressed into the Navy was a merchant seaman who was just home from the sea and probably celebrating at the old tavern or pub and uh, would be whisked away by the press gang for a, a, a deployment on a, one of his majesty's uh, warships. Um, landlubbers was a term uh, for landsmen and they were not very skilled. They weren't professional sailors. So uh, they would be kind of your cannon fodder, if you will. They would eventually be trained, but what was highly prized by the press gang of course, was experienced, skilled seamen. Now, uh, food. There's often this myth that uh, you join the Royal Navy, you go out to sea and you starve. Wrong, 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 wrong. This was hard physical labor uh, at sea, and they had to have the calories. Typical Royal Navy sailor consumed 4,000 calories a day. Now, it wasn't a great diet. Think about no refrigeration. Uh, your things that would spoil like uh, cheese and butter would give out pretty quick. And there's a lot of salt pork, salt beef, salt fish, peas, oatmeal, pretty basic, but 4,000 calories a day. You had to have that or you just simply couldn't, couldn't operate. One of the great advantages that the Royal Navy had is they realized pretty early in the 18th century that a way to avoid scurvy, which we now know was a lack of vitamin C, could be cured uh, by, uh, by lime juice. Um, typically they would add lime juice or some other citrus, citrus that's high in vitamin C, would add that to the grog ration, which was rum cut with water. And of course the alcohol in the rum would, would kill the bacteria. And then now you have the lime juice or lemon juice providing the, the vitamin C. Hence the term for Brits, limeys, where it comes from. Well, what about the officers? This uh, drawing reminds me of my Navy days, Friday night at the officers club at Naval Air Station, Oceana. Topic for a different night. Um, love this picture, the pretty barmaid. Well, officers were typically uh, drawn from the middle and minor aristocracy because this was a way for social and economic uh, mobility. The army, if you wanted a commission, Typically, it had to be purchased, and that meant uh, a lot of money. But the Navy, totally different. 
uh, you could really in the army be a junior officer doofus because you had uh, sergeants and corporals that kept you out of trouble. But a naval officer had to be exceptionally skilled and talented. Um, the sea is highly unforgiving. And, uh, and you've got to have people that know what they're doing. So it was essentially open to uh, anyone with talent, particularly from the middle uh, and, and the minor aristocracy, middle class and the minor aristocracy. So what would happen is you would typically start out as a ship's boy or cabin boy at about age eight, nine, 10, long in there. Uh, most often, if a relative of yours was, uh, say, an officer on a, on a ship, you would go aboard that ship. Then in your teens, uh, you would become a midshipman, which is like a junior officer. You'd be assigned a, a division, and you expected to learn leadership and professional skills. After several years as a midshipman, if you had proven your medal, uh, you could uh, take the exam for lieutenant. Um, and if you do well, you'd be promoted to lieutenant. As a lieutenant, you might be given command of a smaller warship. Uh, so that was a typical career pattern for, uh, for naval officers. The most famous, of course, in all of history was this gentleman, Viscount, Vice Admiral Viscount uh, Horatio Nelson. Very typical of a naval officer. His uh, father was a Church of England minister, so of the upper middle class. Uh, he started as a cabin boy uh, in his uncle's ship. Uh, he was characterized by being bold, audacious, and innovative, and a risk taker. Uh, he was um, wounded. Uh, he lost an eye in combat. He lost an arm in combat. And there's a famous story about Nelson, uh, the Battle of Copenhagen, 1801. Uh, the Danish were making noises like they were going to ally with France. Well, the Danish had a pretty robust Navy at the time. And so the, the British said, no, we got to knock them out of this before they, they can join up their ships with the French. And so Sir Hyde Parker was the admiral assigned this. Nelson was the um, commander of the van. Now the van is that group of ships that goes in first ahead of the main body. So Nelson is heading into uh, Copenhagen, which at the time had uh, tremendous fortification, uh, tremendous fire. And the story goes that um, Sir Hyde Parker uh, hoisted the flag signal to it. Essentially it's too hot in there, retire. And when uh, Nelson's flag lieutenant, who was uh, with the, the long glass, was reading the flagship signals, pointed that out to him. Uh, the story goes, Nelson took the long glass, put it up to his blind eye that he'd lost in combat, said, I do not see any signal to retire. He kept on going, defeated the Danish and um, bore to his reputation. So we have the term turning a blind eye. Now, the reality is uh, Parker had given Nelson uh, complete authority to withdraw or proceed as he determined. So it's a great story. Nonetheless, that's where we get the term turning a blind eye. Well, let me turn now to Trafalgar because one of the things that constantly um, characterized the British strategic culture was expeditionary. You put a small uh, land force, on the land for specific expedition and you supply them and reinforce them by sea, use your naval power, uh, and you prevent the enemy from doing the same back to you by controlling the seas, uh, command of the sea it's called. Well, Trafalgar is the perfect example of that. Now I mentioned that the original plan uh, here in 1803-04 was to draw off the uh, Royal Navy's covering squadrons, uh, get them out of the channel and allow the French army to invade and finally knock out Britain. Uh, well, Nelson, who was commanding uh, one of the uh, uh, covering squadrons, took the bait and then you had the merry chase uh, of the, uh, the French squadron to the West Indies. I remember that the West Indies, these were still at this time the most valuable colonial possessions uh, because of sugar and other crops, but particularly sugar, molasses uh, for rum. So natural for a French squadron to maybe head into the West Indies and try to do some havoc among the British colonies there. So Nelson followed, Villeneuve was the uh, admiral, combined French and Spanish fleet. And of course he went and when he realized that, uh, that uh, he was being chased by uh, Nelson, he turned around and went back and was attempting to make it into the Mediterranean and back into Toulon, but it didn't happen. 
on the 21st of October, 1805, Nelson caught up with Villeneuve and the combined um, French and Spanish fleet off Cape Trafalgar, which uh, if any of you know the geography of Spain, it's uh, down near Cadiz, the, the city of Cadiz. Well, the fighting instructions of the day, the typical tactic was to come alongside your line, alongside the enemy line and basically pummel each other. Well, Nelson said, no, we're not gonna do that. We're going to break the line into places. And so he formed his ships into two columns here, uh, the Royal Sovereign under Admiral Collingwood and HMS Victory under Nelson. And by the way, if you, many of you I'm sure have been to Britain and uh, actually uh, been aboard HMS Victory at Portsmouth Naval Yard. If you haven't, if you ever go to Britain, make a trip down to Portsmouth and see Nelson's flagship, HMS Victory. Well, essentially, uh, they broke the line in a couple of places and it became a melee battle where the superior British uh, seamanship and gunnery uh, dominated. So this pretty much ended uh, any uh, French sea power uh, and really established the Britain as the, the dominant naval power literally up until probably 1943 when the U.S. Navy surpassed the British Royal Navy. So for almost 150 years. Well, Nelson, um, what he would do is he would completely brief his ship commanders as to what the battle plan was. And this meant that every ship captain understood what was to happen. Uh, really without any direction from the flagship. In fact, Nelson only sent two tactical signals in the entire battle. England expects that every man will do his duty and press the enemy more closely. Uh, and that illustrates Nelson's leadership. Uh, captains and crews were well-prepared, ready for the battle, briefed in advance. They knew exactly what was expected of them. Uh, French gunnery had declined in the French Revolution. One of the reasons why the French did much better in the uh, American war was they had created the Corps of Seamen Gunners and think early gunners mates. Well, the, the French revolutionaries saw that as being too elitist. And so they disbanded the Corps of Seamen Gunners and the French Navy proficiency in gunnery and sailing really went down from there. Uh, so that meant that uh, the British gunnery, because they literally practiced it every day, stand your guns, gun drills every day at sea, uh, so far superior. Uh, unfortunately for Nelson, uh, he didn't survive the battle. He was on the quarterdeck of HMS Victory and a French Marine in the, the fighting top, the, the, the rigging here uh, shot down and uh, the bullet actually entered his um, shoulder and broke his spine. If you're ever in London and you get a chance, go see uh, his uniform at the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich. Uh, they actually have the, uh, the uniform there that uh, he was killed in. So Trafalgar, 1805. Uh, I love this painting. It's an example of what I call heroic art. Uh, this is how the public uh, impression was made because we're here before photography or, or any of that type of uh, media. And so you would see these heroic uh, art pictures like this depicting, uh, depicting events. All right, so the height of the Napoleonic Empire, there you see it, uh, do, uh, dominated Spain. Actually, uh, the Spanish monarchy was thrown out and uh, Napoleon put his uh, brother in as the king of Spain. And uh, the Confederation of the Rhine, a lot of these Germanic states were organized as essentially satellite states. So what uh, Napoleon tried next was the continental system which meant that all along the coast, it was forbidden to trade with Great Britain. Well, the Russians said, nay, 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 we're not gonna do that. Uh, we're still gonna trade with, uh, with Great Britain. And that caused Napoleon in 1812 to put together a huge army, a grand armée of about 600,000 troops uh, to march into Russia in 1812. Now, one of the things about Russian strategic culture, it doesn't matter whether it's the communists, the czars, or whatever it is they have now, um, trading space for time. It's a typical strategic uh, uh, plan for them. And this is exactly what happened. There was one big battle, um, which Napoleon won, but the Russians simply retreated. They occupied Moscow, uh, but 
had to evacuate the city and that horrendous retreat back from Moscow in the middle of the Russian winter. And there is a wonderful diagram that shows the deterioration of the army. What's interesting is it deteriorated well before they ever arrived in Moscow, but certainly by the time, see the black line is the return. Look at that. That's what they started with. That's what they ended up with. So of the 600,000 men that started out in June of 1812, um, by the time they returned, there were only 10,000 left. Now let me turn to Waterloo and wrap up here. British coal steel. And by the way, um, those are reenactors from Britain. Uh, they're reenacting the first regiment of foot guards known today as the, uh, uh, well, let's see, the Grenadier Guards, I think. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is a picture taken from the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. It was actually held on the actual Waterloo battlefield. So I'm gonna show you a few pictures from that. So Napoleon returned back to Paris by December of 1812, uh, a new alliance formed and all through 1813 to 14, uh, the French empire was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back until finally in April of 1814, they literally were knocking on the gates of Paris. And uh, Napoleon was forced to abdicate. He went off to the island of Elba, but came back in March of 1815 with about a thousand followers. And that formed what was known as the Hundred Days. The Hundred Days. He re-raised the army and tried to uh, re-implement the Napoleonic Empire. I think the reality was, even if he had won at Waterloo, there were so many forces arrayed against him by this point that uh, I think ultimately uh, it would have collapsed again, but certainly Waterloo was a, a wonderful defining point in the end of the empire. And a lot has to do with this gentleman, Field Marshal Arthur Wellesley, first Duke of Wellington, who was a younger son of, of, a, of an Irish uh, Earl. Uh, he uh, rose rapidly in the army. He was a, a lieutenant colonel at age 26. He fought in a number of campaigns and he was the main commander for the Iberian campaign, which was in Spain and Portugal. Uh, and it was so effective that Wellington never had more than 35,000 British troops. Now he had a number of Portuguese and Spanish troops on his side, but the French lost in that period 250,000 casualties. And uh, Napoleon referred to uh, the Iberian campaign as his Spanish ulcer. So uh, Wellington came back, um, was made a Duke and a field marshal in 1814. And he was the allied commander in Brussels uh, by uh, 1815 as Napoleon uh, reconstituted his army. And in June of 1815, crossed the river into Belgium and that precipitated the Battle of Waterloo, 18 June, 1815. By the way, I, uh, on this map here, just to, to show you uh, some things here, that 200th anniversary uh, commemoration in, uh, in Belgium was on the actual battlefield. It was on this side of the battlefield. Uh, the Belgians erected uh, bleachers along here and along here. There were 100,000 spectators each night. They ran it for two nights. 100,000 spectators. Now this little trail here, a little road here, now is a six lane highway across the battlefield. But the rest of the battlefield is still owned by the same families that owned it in 1815. So think about the history there. Uh, so again, the, the reenactment battle was here. Uh, my wife was more or less right about in there in the bleachers and she said, there was so much smoke and haze as is typical of a black powder battle, pre-modern battle. Um, and you could see troops moving about, but unless you really knew what uh, was supposed to be happening, uh, it was very difficult to follow. Nonetheless, 100,000 spectators each night for this uh, battle reenactment. Another interesting uh, feature here, a couple of them I wanna point out, that's a young lady there. Um, I noticed that probably about half of the reenactors portraying the, the Prussian troops uh, were in fact um, teenage women, uh, very popular there with them. Uh, the other feature, this, this French uh, cuirassier or heavy cavalry, look at how elaborate that uniform is. Some of these uniforms, not even to mention 
what it costs to maintain the horses and the and all the kit there. But uh, these uniforms can run ten to fifteen thousand um, dollars. So this is some pretty serious, so pretty serious reenacting. Uh, these gents here uh, portraying the uh, 71st Regiment uh, Highland Light Infantry, they came from Australia. So it literally was uh, from all over the world, people coming to commemorate uh, and reenact the Battle of Waterloo. Well, eventually, uh, as the Prussians appeared on the right flank of the French late in the day, um, pretty much uh, pretty much over. And at this point, Napoleon committed the old guard. Uh, the old Imperial Guard. These were the old grizzled veterans, many that had been in the French army for 20 years. And Napoleon used them as their reserve. And there you see them advancing. And the story goes, um, they saw what looked like an opening in the line and the Duke of Wellington just riding alone along this crest of the ridge. What it really was, was about 1,100 British foot guards were crouched down in the rye field. And as the old guard approached, Wellington shouted to General Maitland, who commanded the, the uh, foot guards, now, Maitland, there's your time. And up popped over a thousand British troops and a volley just leveled the old guard. Once the old guard was shattered, uh, the rest of the French army uh, began pretty much uh, a retreat. Um, I was um, privileged to be there, uh, portraying a fusilier of the 21st Royal North British Fusiliers. And um, there were about 400 uh, folks that came over from the United States and Canada. Uh, and we formed up the British Fourth Division. And on the second night of the uh, reenactment, we were the ones portraying the foot guards crouched down in the rye field. Uh, and when we popped up and leveled the volley, and uh, the old guard went down and, and uh, <laughs> they started singing Les Marseillais. Uh, it really was... Uh, it's quite an event, 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. Twilight of Empire. So Napoleon was forced to abdicate uh, a second time. He was exiled to the island of St. Helena in the Atlantic, and there he died in 1821. A lot of rumors about how he died. Uh, one that went around for a long time was the British killed him. Why bother? He's not going anywhere. It's the middle of the Atlantic and a rocky island. More likely, he was. Um, uh, poisoned by uh, uh, by some Frenchmen who feared that he might try to make a comeback, and they were supporters of the newly established, re-established Bourbon monarchy. Uh, or more likely, he just simply died of stomach cancer. Uh, you really can't see it, but you've often seen a stand up here. Napoleon portrayed as this inside his coat. He probably died of stomach cancer. So it is very likely that um, uh, that that was bothering him for a number of years. Uh, and uh, through the 19th century, that became very common, very popular. So if you look at the uh, photographs of, uh, of Civil War generals, particularly, you'll see they've all got the, the jacket unbuttoned with the hand in it. Well, that was an affectation that came from uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. So that's just sort of a little brief survey of the history of the French Revolution, the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, in the Napoleonic Empire. And so with that, Britta, uh, we have about 10 minutes for any questions. All right, there haven't been any, surprisingly, that trickled in so far. Um, Hello, folks. Which is surprising because we've had lots of questions the last two meetings. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can type them into the chat. Someone has their hand raised, maybe. The... Yeah, some people will, will leave during the Q&A. So before you leave, just a reminder, uh, the, the fourth and last session is Thursday of next week, the 20th. Uh, and that'll be the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05 and the rise of the Imperial Japanese Navy. All right. So yeah, questions. James allow, Murphy raised his hand. I'm gonna allow this person to talk um, just in case for some reason he's not able to type in the chat box, so. Okay. James. If You're you up, un James. You unmute yourself, you can. Great, it's great, 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 great presentation. Uh, Thank we've you. Seen you before in North Kingstown a couple of times and I was really uh -huh. anxious to see what you did today. And I, my big question, I guess, is what 
what can we learn today from the experience that the British and the French and the rest of the Western Europe uh, learned uh, during during these these years from the French Revolution on through Napoleon? I mean, is there some some lesson that can help us navigate our current politics and international relations? Uh, all right, let me split that into two thoughts: uh, domestic and international. Domestic. Pay attention to the people. Um, there is, unfortunately, in the Western world, we hear about it all the time, the, the international elite. Um, and, and I'm just gonna be real blunt here. In the United States, a lot of people in that say, New York, DC, Los Angeles, Triangle or Triad, uh, they sort of live in a bubble of their own. Uh, and, and they don't seem to really have a clue about how the other 99% of us are operating the world. And um, they tend to have assumptions that are just totally unworkable and unsustainable, but they live in a bubble. And I think that's essentially what you saw the first and second estate in France doing until a financial crisis exploded on them and they were forced to rely upon the third estate. And you saw how the third estate um, responded. So I, I would say from a de domestic lesson learned viewpoint, pay attention to what the people think uh, and, and guide your policy uh, by that. The, um, the second thing in terms of international strength, strength, strength. Uh, had it not been for, the, for Great Britain staying in the fight, uh, never really being defeated, uh, by the French because they maintained that strong sea power and therefore they had many, many options. Um, there are a lot of places in the world, this is no secret to anyone, particularly uh, in, in Asia, where that culture emphasizes uh, strength. They don't care about words and dialogue and good intentions. Um, they value strength and uh, the use of strength. And we see it right now in Russia with Vladimir Putin. And he's going to push, 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 push until he runs up against the wall. That's just the way culturally it operates in that area of the world. Um, so the, the way Napoleon was de eventually defeated, I think, was by, by British sea power. And uh, unless the Western world maintains um, the capability, and it, it's not just military capability, but it's political strength, it's diplomatic strength and resolution. Um, and economic strength. So you, you hear a lot about um, uh, economic uh, sanctions or whatever. That's just simply a, another weapon in the toolbox of nations to keep um, the more aggressive uh, folks uh, on, keep them tamped down and keep them from uh, playing bad in the sandbox. So that's really how I, I would look at it, lessons from the period that we can, uh, we can take today. Thank you. As a, as a former Navy JAG officer, I really appreciated the commentary about the Code Napoleon. Oh, yeah. I have one, I have one last question. Is, is naval sea power as important in today's world as it was in Admiral Nelson's? I think it's as important or far more important. Um, you, have, you have two, three really aggressive, well, four if you throw in the North Koreans, but not in terms of of really seriousness other than the fact they can wreak havoc with, uh, with uh, their region, Japan especially. Um, but if you look at the Iranians uh, and their, their ability to project power into the Persian Gulf and threaten that oil lifeline and from someone who was uh, as a young Lieutenant riding uh, big targets, think tankers back in the, um, the tanker war, uh, the, Operation Earnest Will, when we reflagged the, the uh, Kuwaiti tankers and dared the Iranians to attack them, uh, they literally could have devastated the world economy with just a few small boats and mines until we intervened with our naval power, ours and the British naval power. Um, so yeah, it's very relevant there. Uh, China is pretty obvious. There's a reason why um, the Japanese Navy, I'm gonna call it the Imperial Japanese Navy, because they have an emperor, it's a navy, and it's Japanese. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, um, there's a reason why they're rebuilding aircraft carriers and, and strengthening the naval budget. 
there's a reason why the Australians are uh, starting to build or, or hoping to build nuclear submarines uh, and why the US Marines are putting a permanent detachment there in the north part of Australia. Uh, because of the potential naval power of China, uh, the Russians are rebuilding their fleet that had essentially deteriorated uh, in the post-Cold War period. They're building it back up and they're also being very much aggressive, more aggressive in the, uh, uh, in the Mediterranean like it was back in the 70s and 80s. So yeah, I think it's maybe even more relevant today um, because of the speed with which things can happen uh, for the United States, for Great Britain. Um, well, Great Britain, uh, what did they do? They practically discontinued or, or decommissioned all of their aircraft carriers and they said, holy smokes, they probably said something worse than that. Uh, and now um, they're fielding two, what we would call super carriers, the Queen Elizabeth class. So uh, the Western world is beginning to, I think, wake up um, from this 30 year uh, drowsiness about uh, the intentions of some of these uh, totalitarian uh, powers. And so a uh, long, long drawn out answer to your very brief question. Yeah, I think maintaining sea, sea power, sea control, command of the sea is vitally important for the future of the world. Um, we have a few more questions okay. in the chat box. Um, what role did Haiti play in his downfall? What role did Haiti play? Well, really one role. Um, with the slave revolt that pretty much um, decimated the, the plantation economy there, they sent in about 25,000 troops and not many of them made it back. Most just died of diseases. Uh, Napoleon certainly could have used those 25,000 troops. Um, other than that, uh, other than the loss of income from Haiti as a, as a colony, that certainly would have been part of the economic picture, uh, but 25,000 troops uh, to be completely wasted away, uh, I think had at least an impact, um, not profound, but certainly an impact. All right. Um, what motivated Napoleon's campaigns throughout Europe? <laughs> well, one school of thought would say megalomania, um, you, you cannot be a person of that power and commanding presence without being somewhat narcissistic, maybe even megalomaniacal. But historically, you got to remember what had been going on since literally the time of, well, well before, but certainly as the European kingdoms pretty much coalesced in the 17th century. Uh, coming out of the medieval period into the modern period where you could definitively say, this is the modern country of France, the modern country of fill in the blank. Um, and really beginning with Louis XIV in the mid uh, to late part of the uh, 17th century, uh, France had been very imperially aggressive, uh, particularly in terms of trying to dominate the low countries. So that's Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg. And that set off a whole series of of wars for literally 150 years that only finally ended on the field at Waterloo. Um, a number of wars, the, the War of Spanish Succession, the uh, Seven Years War, the um, uh, uh, Nine Years War, the 1690s, um, the War of American Independence, although not fought on the continent, was certainly about French aggressiveness as well. So all Napoleon was really doing was finally executing what the French had been attempting to do for the previous 150 years. And that is established a domination um, of Western Europe and, uh, and create a, an empire, French empire. He pulled it off. Um, was the guillotine used by any other civilizations besides the French? That's a good question. And I really don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. Uh, my, my sense is uh, that it was so associated with the terror that it would be very difficult for any other country to adopt that because of the public perception. So my answer would be not without any definitive evidence, 
Uh, I don't know of any other country that use it. There may be some instances, but uh, probably not very many. And, and I would say chances are it would be because of the pretty ill association with uh, the terror. Now, having said that, the French did keep using that as a means of execution, uh, I want to say up until at least the 1960s. So um, it was still uh, a way to execute capital, uh, capital convicts, uh, but I don't think anywhere else or, or on any grand scale. To what extent, if any, did the American Revolution encourage the French to rebel? Quite a bit. Um, think about Rochambeau, who has a strong association, uh, obviously, here in Rhode Island. Uh, think about all the French soldiers and sailors that participated in the War of American Independence in support of the, uh, the Patriots uh, side. Uh, and now they go back home, they're out of the army, and their family's suffering. One of the problems that exacerbated France in, uh, in the period was in the 1780s, there were a number of very bad harvests. And in that pre-industrial uh, period, you were largely living hand to mouth. If you were a small farmer, uh, you, your idea was to grow enough, to produce enough, to feed your own family, and maybe have a little bit of surplus to sell. But if you had a bad growing season, uh, too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold, uh, famine was just around the corner. So if you are, say, a soldier who went, stood there at Yorktown, Virginia, and watched uh, your longtime enemy, the, the British surrendering and looking across at these ragtag Continental Army guys and saying, holy smokes, look what they did. They threw off the yoke of the monarchy. Um, that's going to drive a lot of the of the feeling. So uh, I, I think that certainly was a, an impact. And then you did have a few aristocrats that had uh, seen the American example, like the, the Marquis de Lafayette, Gilbert de Mautier, uh, who supported the French Revolution up until the point that they started lopping off heads. In fact, I think he was even imprisoned at one point, uh, but he survived. Uh, but certainly people like him looked to the American example and uh, and to the British example, the, the English Revolution of the 17th century that ultimately by 1689 established that parliament, the, the representative of the people, elected representative is, is the sovereign authority. And they're comparing that to the, the Bourbon monarchy, which was an absolutist monarchy. Remember the States General had not met in almost two centuries. So there was no representative of the people. So people who are looking at the British Re uh, English Revolution, um, the 17th century and the American Revolution of the 18th century, they said, why not here? We need that here. So yeah, I think that it did have a profound effect, not just the economic problems it created for the French royal finances. All right, this question slash comment is a little mm -hmm. bit long, so I'll just read the whole thing and then you can ask okay. me anything. Um, so this is from Elaine Krupp. Um, just a note for a Professor Carp Carpenter, I took your VN class a few months ago at Ollie. Thank you for this. My question, have you read the book Napoleon's Plunder and the Theft of Veronese's Feast by Cynthia Saltzman? Um, and then no, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, look behind me. You're looking at one of eight bookshelves, bookcases. I would love to have the time to read all these marvelous histories and books, but um, it's just very little time. So I will, I will take a look at that. Uh, but no, I haven't read it, unfortunately. Um, she just quickly explained that it's um, about how some art historians refer, refer to Napoleon as the greatest art thief in history. The book shows how, if the directory told him to come back from Italy with 10 paintings, he returned with 20. Um, <laughs> Oh, we'll get to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the the, uh, the Germans in World War II were pretty notorious for that as well. All right. Well, I think that was the last question. I don't see any more in the chat box. Uh, I see uh, the top of my screen says Q and A two. Did yep. We get so that those? was um that was the question I just read. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. People were doing the chat box and the Q and A. Excellent. 
All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I uh, look forward to seeing everybody um, next uh, Thursday, the 20th, and uh, talk about the Russo-Japanese War, 1904-1905. Uh,